This week on the Back Table Podcast. Everybody's going to need ongoing treatment during their life if they suffer from vein disease. Once a vein patient, always a vein patient. And if all you can do is truncal procedures, your patients, first of all, they're not going to be fully treated, but they're going to come back in a year or three or five with a recurrence. And what a lot of folks do, oh, well, sorry, we've done everything we can. We've done the simplest procedure that reimburses the most. And, and now you can, they, of course, they don't say that. And now you can go about your business and wear hose for the rest of your life. That's garbage. One out of three patients I see in my office, that's new patients, have been treated somewhere else. And we're going to fix them, usually with foam sclera therapy. And they're going to feel better. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week. I am very excited to introduce our guest today, Dr. Chris Pittman from Vein 911 Vein Treatment Centers in Florida. Welcome, Chris. Aaron, I couldn't be more thrilled to be with you and mostly IR colleagues out there. I'm very thrilled to be here today. Thanks for asking me to uh, speak. Yeah, we, uh, we wanted to have you on the show because we know that you are a massive foam enthusiast and um, you've never performed a phlebectomy in over 15 years in the superficial vein practice. Is that correct? That, that is absolutely correct. And the ironic uh, thing about that is I was originally trained by a vascular surgeon who said I didn't need to n- do a phlebectomy. I believed him. I think he's right. And uh, friends don't let friends get vein surgery. Okay. And you're also a moderator for the worldwide uh, blog called Foam Sclerotherapy Experts on LinkedIn uh, with nearly 500 physicians from around the world. So if you guys are interested, I would I suggest jumping on that. And you're also the founder of Vein 911 Vein Treatment Centers. Tell us a little bit about the, the Vein Treatment Center, how you came up with the name and where you're at today. About 10 years ago, I set out to be among the best in the world at venous and lymphatic medicine. I'm a eucalyptus eating koala bear, a bamboo shoot eating panda. I'm trained IR like everybody else. I've never suffered from any turf incursion. I've done hundreds, if not a thousand atherectomies, carotid stents, stroke intervention, uterine fibroid embo, everything, the whole gamut. And I set out 10 years ago to be a eucalyptus eating koala bear. And when you do something all day, every day, you get pretty darn good at it. And that was what we set out to do. And, and by golly, we've executed on that, on that mission and vision. Vein 911, uh, the name is a called urgent education about venous and lymphatic disorders and their effect on health and wellness. Okay, great. And just a real quick, how, what is, was there, was there an event or a patient, something that inspired you to, to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to go and do this all together, dedicate my whole practice to this. Well, I, I got started in a, in a group practice and became quite successful very quickly. Believe it or not, uh, a lot of IRs will find this funny. It's, it's the story's worth it. I didn't want to do vein care. <laughs> Way back in 0405, the group thought it'd be a great idea to put lasers in people and earn several thousand dollars doing it. And I said, hey, folks, this is not love them and leave them medicine. I was trained very clinically at University of California, San Diego. I said, this really doesn't fit into a large group model. You know, we're actually taking care of patients, following them up, all that kind of thing. One of our executive committee members bought a laser and said, hey, go do something with it. I started doing it. I got good at it, really loved it. And uh, that's, how, that's how it all started. Why I'm so passionate and, and committed to it is because we're taking care of patients who the worst thing they did was uh, pick the wrong parents. It's a genetic illness. You could be a, eat right and exercise to you blue in the face, eat all the broccoli you want. And if you're going to get vein disease, you're going to get it. It's like eyeglasses. It affects around 50% of Americans if they live long enough. So it's a worthy area for anyone to focus uh, their career on, career on, in my opinion. 
I agree. There's a lot of disease out there, as you know, and it's, it's, you know, a lot of people don't even realize the underlying reasons for their, their vein disease and why their legs hurt so much. So kudos to you for, for taking that on. I also, I know that you've got a, a, a reality show coming out around the practice. And um, if you want, could you talk briefly about the, the show that's coming out before we jump into foam sclero? Well, well, of course. And I remember I'm a recovering detail guy, not known to be short winded, ask any of the leaders I hang out with. But look, I did not embark on a reality TV show because I wanted to see myself on TV. I'm old. I got wrinkly skin under my chin and all that jazz. But I was privileged when I was asked about three years ago to lead policy advocacy at American Vein and Lymphatic Society. I've got a a 30-year career in politics and advocacy. And a year into it, after attending international and national meetings, I realized a lot of th stuff is being uh, talked about in a silo. We just published you know, the Everett trial in the New England Journal of Medicine, arguably the most respected journal in the world nearly three years ago, showing beyond a shadow of a doubt that referring wound care patients to a vein doctor is going to result in a wound that heals faster and more durably, yet practice patterns have not changed. Now, why I'm so thrilled to be talking to IRs is we have a lot of context about stuff like this. For God's sakes, I was doing fibroid embolization 25 years ago. Despite it being FDA approved as safe and effective, I, you know, we're still belly aching over not doing this procedure because of kind of turf issues and things like that. So, I decided a year into it that nothing was going to change unless we did some grassroots advocacy. So reality shows what we do in 2020 and 2021. And so I got some sponsors and embarked down that road. It's not about me. It's not about vein 911. It's about helping patients who suffer needlessly. They go to doctor after doctor, even your above average primary care doctor really doesn't truly understand venous disease much less recognize it. So I was compelled to do the show. Yeah, I, I caught a couple of trailers on on LinkedIn and it, it looks both educational and entertaining. So looking forward to, to catching the, the show. What, what uh, is it gonna be on a certain platform? I am working with um, some very credible people right now on distribution. Stay tuned. I, I'll let you know. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so for the uninitiated, you know, our audience, as you know, Chris, uh, uh, we have a lot of not only inter practicing interventional radiologists, but also, you know, we do have some vascular surgeons who, who tune in, you know, all the, all the endovascular specialties, but we do have a, a fair amount of trainees and young IRs. So for the, the uninitiated who don't really know much about foam sclero, other than maybe BRTOs that they learned in, in training or something, can you tell us a little bit about the, the history and background of foam sclero therapy? I know you had mentioned to me earlier that it was predicted to replace all modalities of vein care nearly 20 years ago, but then came along all these other modalities, as you mentioned, laser, RF, even glue. Tell us, tell us a little bit of history about it. Well, absolutely. And uh, I don't want to wax too effusive. A lot of this information, if not all of it, would be available at Foam Sclera Therapy Experts website. Foam Sclera Therapy has been around for decades. It was repopular repopularized by Cabrera somewhere in the mid-90s out in Granada, Spain. It was started to be adopted about when the new modalities, radiofrequency and laser came into being about 2000. And he's now dearly departed, but Dr. John Bergen, a visionary vascular surgeon, pioneer of venous medicines, quoted in 08, and I'll read it to you. The advent of foam scleric therapy has been one of the most important developments in the field of phlebology. Just as surgery has evolved into more minimal invasion, so has the treatment of varicose veins. Foam scleric therapy is quick, efficient, easy to use, and inexpensive, and is widely believed to become the dominant form of therapy for varicose veins. If you, I've I posted or curated this at Foam Sclera Therapy website, but in 2009, uh, many of the luminary vein docs who you would recognize felt pretty much the same way as little as 12 years ago, but it's not gotten to where it needs to be. And there are many reasons for that. Yeah. Let's jump into that. What do you think is the main reason and maybe some, some secondary reasons? 
Well, before I launch into that, I want to make some uh, disclosures or uh, sure. you know, potential conflicts of interest, but not real conflicts of interest. First of all, <clears throat> I am uh, a board member on the American Vein and Lymphatic Society, and I'm chair of their advocacy uh, committee, and I also represent the AVLS at the AMA. I'm not talking on behalf of AVLS right now. I'm obviously talking on behalf of myself, Vein 911, and how we practice here. I'm also a managing director for the nation's largest uh, network of independent vein practices, health performance specialists. And then finally, I was compelled for many of the same reasons I already shared to stand up a charitable uh, 5013C organization called Trans American Sclerotherapy Institute about six months ago that is dedicated to sclerotherapy and the education of sclerotherapists. So with that out of the way, I can tell you very easily why foam sclerotherapy is not where it needs to be. First of all, there's an absence of champions for the procedure. I'd like uh, anyone to name a, a champion for foam sclerotherapy in the United States. If you can name a luminary out there. Um, you. I, <laughs> I, I, I ain't a luminary, but I can tell you, I took on that mantle five years ago when I stood up Foam Square Therapy Experts website. And you sh we should all ask ourselves, why is that? Now, there's a lot of ignorance of, about the technique. Why is that? Academia has, frankly, because I've been part of academia, actually, uh, a long, long time ago, and I still have an appointment at the university here in Tampa, but they've, we poorly described the best practices for foam and how to do it. Lack of enthusiasm for ultrasound guided foam sclera therapies compounded by very real factors, including not the least of which is industry, medical industry has no profit stake in ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy adoption or success of foam. So UGFS is not protected, defended, nor promoted. And that's a very real factor, but there's others. Payment for ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy is less than other treatment vein modalities. That's part of uh, the reason. Other reasons, proper ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy techniques poorly described. Um, thus, you know, some of the things I've been compelled to do. It's an amazing future of vein care procedure and all endovascular specialists should understand it much better than, than they do. The, I'll keep going. Formal physician training on ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy seems not to exist in this country. Mm -hmm. There are people who go to Honduras and other parts of the world and bring people to do foam, but I'm unaware of really deep in-depth training on ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy in this country. Latin America, over 70% of their patients are treated with foam sclera therapy. I could go on. It's a well-accepted, oft-used procedure in other parts of the world, but not the United States. There's a constant onslaught of misguided academic papers focused on comparing competing vein treatment modalities based on technical success alone, hmm. and a comparison of modalities based on one-and-done vein treatment. Uh, one-and-done yeah. vein treatment is is a misguided thing that is done in this country. More about that later. A uh, couple more things. Increasing attempts by industry over the last few years to characterize physician-generated foam as dangerous, despite ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy being a standard of care procedure around the world, with reams of papers over the last 20 years in support of its effectiveness and safety profile. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay. No, that was a lot, but I, you know, it's worth, I definitely, it needs to be said because, you know, those are all true and having gone through training and the only time I learned the Tessari method was, like I said, for a BRTO type of procedure, but we, I, I never in my training and um, I know others, you know, really, if it would, if somebody had a vein clinic, they were doing either laser or RF ablation. Um, and there was very, very little being said about foam scleral therapy. Let's let's jump into because one thing I I found confusing when I first started doing foam sclero for for veins was the types of sclerosis that were out there, what to use, what not to use, what's you know the safety profiles. Could you briefly discuss you know sotradecol, polydocanol, hypertonic saline, and you know what you use and and what not to use? I will struggle with doing it briefly, yeah. <laughs> but. But, uh, but I think I can accomplish that. First of all, let's get hypertonic saline off the burner. Okay. <laughs> um, that just shouldn't be used. 
cosmetically, medically, or, or anything else. We have two FDA-approved sclerosants in the country. One is sotradecol, one is polydocanol. In my opinion, um, both are, are safe and effective and appropriate for ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy and, frankly, for cosmetic visual injection sclerotherapy. But since we're focused on medical foam right now, you can use either. And I've used both FDA-approved types as well as compounded types. I prefer to use FDA-approved sclerosins, but I respect any physician's right to practice with compounded or off-label anything. In fact, in IR, we're really used to using a lot of off-label stuff. And as a specialty, we're really comfortable with it. But to get, get back to this, what, what we do is we use 1% FDA-approved sclera polydocanol for our ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, can you define the difference between compounded and non-compounded and kind of examples of those? Uh, yes, and it does get complicated pretty quickly. So the, the FDA, you know, anything that's not FDA approved is considered compounded. So both sotradecol and polydocanol are easily available from compounding pharmacies as a compounded sclerosin. Right. They're, they're readily accessible. When we take the FDA-approved versions of sotradecol or polydocanol esclera in the country, and we mix it with any kind of gas, physiologic gas, CO2, O2, a combination, or room air, the FDA considers that compounded. So, so if you're yeah. using a compounded sclerosin liquid, and then you mix it with air, you could probably... <laughs> kind of make a joke about it. You're kind of double dipping. You're kind of double compounding. Right. Again, right. it's neither here nor there. In in my you know considered health policy expert position, I respect the the rights of any physician to use the the compound that that they see fit. So I don't I don't get into the merits of compounded sclerosin versus non compounded. It's a somewhat controversial area that uh, a lot have spoken about, but, but right. for me, I can tell you what I do. I use non-compounded sclerosant, 1% polydocanol. Yeah. And that's medical. what I used as well. I, there, there's also the available 0.5%, I guess some people use that for, you know, spider veins, but that that's meant to be used not as a foam, I guess. The zero point five percent. Well, you could. Yeah, I do dilute one percent esclera down to zero point two five percent, and I use it as a foam. So gotcha. the answer to everything in my office is foam. Foam. Everything. No matter what so the percentage is. Yeah. Co cos cosmetic uh, spider vein treatment. I use foam sclerotherapy. I use point two five percent esclera foamed in a one one to four room air dilution. Some people may think that's blasphemous, but I use uh, visual injection foam sclerotherapy on cosmetic all the time. That's yeah. a whole other podcast. Right, I know. Um, <laughs> no, but it's. A, I think it's a great, it, to me, when I learned that trick that I, you know, I wasn't trained to do that. I was trained to just do straight liquid, you know, a sclera 0.5%. But then when I realized, well, it's so much more effective to, to just foam, you, to do it by with foam, even though you're diluting it, it's displacing that blood from the spider vein more effectively than the liquid is. Aaron, you're pour pouring gas all over me. Not, <laughs> not, I, basically, why do I do it? I can do more spider veins, uh, yeah. less needle sticks, more effectively. Foam has less resistance. It travels further. All spider veins are like weeds. They have roots and you got to get the roots. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get a little bit more into technique. Sorry. I, I kind of Never there, but and also not to get too far into the weeds with this whole compounded versus non-compounded. But I I do remember it being a term that was it was important when when reimbursement came in. You know when when you're dealing with you know billing insurance companies, whether whether it was compounded or non-compounded. I am going to put that to rest very okay. quickly. There there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. So I think what you might be referring to is, this, I think it's now a notion that Medicare will only pay for FDA approved devices and procedures. Now as IRs, do I need to go further? How many stents, <laughs> how many stents do we use right. that are actually FDA approved in the vascular system? 
how many clot busting procedures do we do that are FDA approved? When I stopped doing a lot of that stuff five some years ago, I don't think a single one was. Right. So right. again, we we what's so fun actually and exciting and many things about phlebology, venous and lymphatic medicine is all the specialties involved. But as IRs, we bring just a wealth of context and experience to superficial venous treatment that other specialties might not enjoy. On the other hand, other specialties have taught me a lot. I'm way over the turf stuff a long time ago. Yeah. Every specialty that, that dedicates themselves to, to venous care has something um, significant to offer the space of venous and lymphatic medicine. But um, we, we have our own perspective on things. We use uh, just about everything we use is off-label and crazy so I would just put that to rest. That is just sure, not, sure. not, you're going to get paid. No one's going to ding you and you're not going to be perp walked into jail. Yeah. And, and can you touch a little bit about Verathena and where that plays or where that comes in with all this? Well, I, again, I, I'm going to give you my own, own personal opinion. I was the first to use Verathena in August of 2014 in the Bay area. I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic stuff. I do not use Verathena probably because I'm an ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy expert with physician generated foam. Yeah. And I think that's really the best answer. There's, there's nothing wrong with Verathena. If you're not using any foam at all, for God's sakes, use something, use, use Verathena. Now there are coding and, and billing and reimbursement issues around all of that, that again, could be a, a partial podcast. Yeah. And again, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with it. I, I was kind of, brought up Arathena just to talk a little bit about room air versus CO2. You you kind of mentioned a little bit about how, you know, there's some, some misinformation out there about what's safest, but you've had a lot of experience. And it sounds like you use room air when you're mixing your foam, right? I, I do use room air. And again, yeah. I respect any anybody's choice to, to use whatever they want. I mean, on yeah. occasion, for various reasons, I will use physiologic gas. However, the standard of care around the world, and frankly, in this country, is room air. Yeah. Um, and I could get into the weeds and the details on that based on policy discussions, but in working with CPT and RUC and other things, but I won't do that right now. Right. But room air is a standard of care. It is, again, it's, it's a safe procedure. You can see all the stuff we've curated at Foam Sclerate Therapy Experts where I can back up everything that I'm saying. Very briefly, I'll... I'll I want to say a few provocative things because we are radiologists and interventional radiologists. We've all seen air in the pulmonary artery on a CT uh, pulmonary uh, angiogram. No one's stroking. Right. Okay? These are just provocative things that I encourage you to go read more about. Yeah. There are bubbles going into IV lines routinely in every hospital in America and the world. People are not stroking. Number three, cardiologists have been doing bubble tests with agitated saline and air for decades. Nobody's stroking. Okay, I'm just, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> okay, right. That's a great So it ain't, it ain't the bubbles. Right. It ain't the bubbles. Right, right. Well, thank you for clearing that up. And um, again, that was just something that I kind of struggled with when I first came out and, and soon found out that it was perfectly safe to do to use room air. So in terms of, foam, you know, speaking of that, starting out, foam sclerotherapy therapy training, you know, for the uninitiated, where and how is the best way to kind of learn something like this? Well, uh, I, I wish I had a, a quick and ready answer for you, but I'd like to really follow up on what I just said. If you do... If you do poorly made physician generated foam and you're and you're injecting large, you know, aliquots of gas in somebody, yeah, you you might hurt them after a while. You know, it's like a gauntlet. So I I, I want to clarify that a bit. You know, it, sure. it depends on the quality of foam you're making, the experience you have to do it. You know, my quick answer is I'm I'm happy to interact or help anyone. I mean, that's why I'm so thrilled to be on this podcast because so many patients can benefit from foam and so many of my colleagues are not using it out there and they should be. Again, I, I've curated from the five years ago, the first few posts that I put in Foam Sclerate Therapy Experts was basically a how I do it. Yeah. Um, I can't point you to anything in the literature 
that shows you how to do it. And frankly, that's beyond disappointing. It's outrageous, actually. Right. Right. I really can't point you to a peer-reviewed journal article that would teach you how to do foam sclerotherapy. And thus, you know, why we got not just a TV thing, but uh, foam sclerotherapy experts and, and the charitable organization that's dedicated to educating sclerotherapists. Got, got a little more work to do. Stay tuned. But we hope to, you know, pump out some videos and other things. And any, anyone's welcome to spend a half day. You know, you learn a lot just a half day hanging out in my office. Want to come down? Happy to host you. We host a lot of people. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I was getting to, you know. It's it, but at least before COVID, did you ever have docs come through and and all the you know, time watch? Yeah, we yeah, we host great. not lay people, business people, docs. No great. big deal. Yeah, that's good. So we'll be sure to include your information with with the podcast in terms of contacting you. And so next step, I, w- I would like to, if you could, walk us through. You know, a typical in our listeners, I'm assuming know the C classification for superficial venous disease, but a C1, C2, C3 being more benign or sorry, more uh, mild disease. And then after that, maybe we'll walk through a more complex C4 through C6, maybe somebody who has ulcers and maybe start with they come in the door. What do you do with compression stockings, you know, before and after treatment? And then we can get into technique. Well, I think there's four important components to evaluating any patient with venous disease. And of course, 80% of that's history. It's 80% history now and a thousand years from now. And I don't care what new machine comes down, but I do, I apologize. I do tend to (laughs) editorialize a bit. History is extremely important. Listen to your patients. There's a whole host of symptoms that are pretty typical for venous disease. A person can have perfect looking legs and be suffering from vein disease. Stay tuned for our next episode where I'm featuring a Olympic caliber uh, beach volleyball player from LA who has two family members with severe venous disease, perfect legs and has swelling to her mid calf. And so do not discard patients as not having venous disease because they look good. That's a fool's errand. Number two, obviously, is physical exam. There are a lot of signs of venous disease. I got to do kind of a shout out on swelling. Swelling's epidemic in the country. Most of it, in my opinion, is due to undiagnosed, untreated vein disease. And I'll tell you why. Because patients don't recognize their swelling, nor do physicians. If you're not touching your patient, every patient, I don't care if they've got chicken legs or the biggest cankles you ever saw, especially the chicken leg people that you saw, there's no swelling there. You cannot tell whether a patient has ankle swelling without touching them. And by that, I mean, take two or three fingers, compress pretty firmly right above the medial malleolus, right on the bone for 30 seconds. In fact, I challenge those listening to this to go to your next cocktail party and do that. And I guarantee you, Um, there's going to be more people than you can imagine that have pitting, okay? If you wait for a patient to tell you they're swelling or you think you can see it, you are making a big mistake. Swelling has to start at some point before it gets to um, the point that a patient or a doctor is going to recognize it. Touch your patients. We do that in our office every day, and I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Aaron, I'm diatribing a bit, but this is so important. We have been collecting serial ankle circumferences, a pitting scale, and the detection of edema on every venous ultrasound in my office for years. Mm. And I can tell you what's better than than even palpation above the medial malleolus. When you do your venous ultrasound and look for venous insufficiency, have your technologist evaluate edema in the peri-GSV area right above the ankle. That's where edema starts. So When's a good time to intervene and prevent the progression of edema, phlebolymphedema, et cetera? I'm going to take it one step further. We all know C3 disease is swelling. There's some controversy about whether you treat C2 disease or varicose veins you know, versus C3. I can tell you that your average vein doc is missing swelling and, and they miscategorize their patients as varicose vein C2 patients because they're not doing what I just said. Yeah. And as radiologists, I don't know anyone who does this. I haven't published it yet. 
got a lot of things I'm trying to accomplish. I'd love help with it for you folks out there, but look for edema when you do your superficial venous insufficiency exam. You're going to, it's, you're going to be bowled over. Yeah. Okay. So obviously the third thing we do is there are objective signs of vein disease on an ultrasound based on diameter of the vein and flow direction. We all know that. But number four, that is often poo-pooed and discounted by folks of, of all types of experience in vein care is a hose trial. Now, there are compression hose and there are compression hose. There's 100 hose companies. As far as I'm concerned, only four are any good, uh, basically, and they're all based in Germany and Switzerland, okay? Mm-hmm. And a proper pair of hose is measured, fitted, graduated, and high quality. They're not you know, oh, just go down to the DME or the pharmacy down the street type stuff. Right. So they're measured and fitted in our office. And when they're uh, said, so that's the difference. Compressions, not compressions, not compression. So the thing we do in our office to really uh, set the right patient expectation and, and frankly help us diagnose and discriminate between sciatica, arthritis, and any number of other things that can happen in legs is we put people in measured, fitted, high quality, graduated compression hose, two days on and two days off for several weeks, for a week or two or three. Yeah. And if that patient feels even marginally better in compression hose, I can, uh, that's vein disease. In gotcha. fact, I'm to the point, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> where I feel like I'm pretty good at diagnosing vein disease with just a hose trial. I don't need to see them. I don't even need to do an ultrasound. If they feel even marginally better in compression hose, they're going to have vein disease. Yeah. Yeah. And so then what do you say to, you know, on the, with, with the whole hose trial thing, obviously anybody that has, that treats vein disease knows about the battle with insurance companies over, you know, these compression uh, stocking, you know, trials. What do you say to them specifically in your note that warrants further treatment after a, a, a hose trial? Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And um, look, we're rule followers here. We don't yeah. cut any corners. Uh, we, you know, follow the rules of our payers. And I recommend everybody do that. You know, I simply explain, uh, again, I told you, I don't filter very many things, but payers job is to take in premium money and not pay it out. Okay, <laughs> that's right. their job. I don't get emotional about it. Again, I'm a policy guy. So I explain that to patients, but I do explain to them that while you're company may require six or 12 weeks of a hose trial. Vein 911 requires several weeks of a hose trial. I think there's merit to it for the reasons I already already, uh, discussed. So anyway, it's important to document in your your chart physical and functional limitations that the patient's suffering from. Because look, they don't show up in your office just because you know, they want to spend money at your front desk and, and waste time. We're all busy. Right. And I'm going to turn this around a little bit. When patients come into your office with leg symptoms, and the only thing you're relying on is an ultrasound, whether there's reflux or not, to determine whether they are vein disease, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that at all. Yeah. Uh, your job is to diagnose those symptoms and figure out why they've got them. So that's what we do here. We diagnose vein-related symptoms. You can't always do that in one visit, two or three, but in six months or, or nine months, you know, time's a diagnostic tool. So I'll, I'll get back on track here. So we, we document the physical and functional limitations. We document whether they feel marginally better in hose. Some people feel so much better in a good pair of hose. They don't even take the darn things off. That actually right. happens. Right. So we just follow the rules. And so yeah. we, after we initially see those patients, we generally see them three weeks later for what we call a mid-hose trial. And then we'll see them at about the six or 12-week point, depending on the criteria of their payer. And we just proceed with treatment. All the payer wants you to do is do a, a trial of conservative measures. It doesn't say that nowhere in the criteria that I'm aware of, anywhere in the country, does it say if they feel better in hose, you're to deny treatment, okay? Right. Or the other way, they they feel no better in hose. Yeah. So I think there's merit. They just want you to try it, right? They want you to do yeah. the conservative trial. Yeah. Payers make a lot of money on the float, and the longer they can delay care, the more money they make. But that's another podcast, Aaron. Well, I know. It, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, your 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 technique is so unique with the two days on, two days off, and. 
knowing how difficult that conversation can be with patients trying to get them to just wear the hose, I was curious to know if you've ever had a payer come back and say, well, you, you did it two days on, two days off. That doesn't qualify. You need to have them wear no, it continuous. I, never. Never. If no, you read good. the criteria carefully, as, as certainly I have, yeah, it's a 90-day hose trial. The rule isn't you got to wear them all day, every day right. for 90 days. That yeah. exists in no criteria that I'm aware of. Further, furthermore, uh, a handful of companies will define whether they're, they need to be 20 millimeters of mercury or not. So right. Right. if you read your payer criteria carefully, you know they, they often don't even talk about the quality of the hose or the pressure, which is a shame because as I previously stated, I think the quality of hose is extremely important, yeah. especially because they need to wear them during treatment and after, and that affects the patient experience. So sure. not only do we have what I feel like are world-class outcomes, but we have a world-class experience in our office and patients must be you know, happy, having a good time and, and feeling good in their hose. Yeah, that sounds like it. Um, so, so we've gotten through the hose trial. You've confirmed from that that they, def- they, they have significant vein disease that warrants treatment. You have your ultrasound, you know what your targets are. Can you walk through, you know, the patient coming in for that that day of foam sclerotherapy? Well, your your average patient's gonna start out with thermal of the trunk veins. Now, uh, why is that? Many of them force me to do that. Number one, okay, gotta do thermal before foam. There's nothing wrong with that, Aaron, because if I don't do thermal ablation, I'm out of business. Okay. <laughs> Cause if you look at the the reimbursement for thermal, maybe twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. You know, uh, let's just pick you know average Medicare rates. Foam maybe two fifty. So right. e- even if I'm convinced I can fix everybody with foam, which actually I am, I will go out of business very quickly in the payer world. So there's nothing wrong with thermal ablation or truncal ablation techniques. They've revolutionized the care of patients over the last twenty years. They're fantastic procedures. What I have a deep problem with is they're not one and done procedures. Vein right. disease is a chronic, progressive disease process that needs ongoing care, like going to the dentist or the eye doctor. And way too many of vein, vein practitioners out there do a bunch of procedures, send people on their way for the rest of their life, and it's, and it's, and it's wrong. One out of three patients I see in my office, that's new patients, have been treated somewhere else, and we're going to fix them usually with foam sclera therapy, and they're going to feel better. Everybody's going to need ongoing treatment during their life if they suffer from vein disease. Once a vein patient, always a vein patient. And if all you can do is truncal procedures, your patients, first of all, they're not going to be fully treated, but they're going to come back in a year or three or five with a recurrence. And what a lot of folks do, oh, well, sorry, we've done everything we can We've done the simplest procedure that reimburses the most. And, and now you can, they, of course, they don't say that. And now you can go about your business and wear hose for the rest of your life. That's garbage. So you can treat these patients, all their tributaries and all the truncal leaking segments that have not been treated very effectively with ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy and patients will feel better and be truly grateful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause I wasn't sure if you, when you met that you do, you know, all foam that you, you were talking about the, the truncal, you know, GSV as well. So you actually will, do you do RF or laser first? I I've done lots of laser. I've done lots of RF, but basically yeah. I'm a thermal ablation person. Got, I do gotcha. the trunk veins and then I get all the branches with foam. Yeah. Every patient in my practice, whether it's C2 or C6 gets a minimum of two foam sessions per leg. I gotcha. Okay. What about a maximum of foam? Is there, is there a maximum? There's really not a maximum. I mean, obviously there's people with severe disease and, and incredible burdens of varicose veins and monstrous veins that, you know, I might do six or more. Yeah. The, the thing is that we need to quit. We need to really dispel and stop is this notion that I'm going to take care of everything this patient needs to in, in just a few weeks. And then that's the end of it. Right. Um, I encourage you to go to my YouTube site. I feature a patient there that you're not going to believe I got rid of all those bulging varicose veins with foam only. You're not going to believe it, but mm. we did. And we did it in two months. 
Um, why am I going into that? Because it's okay to stage these procedures. So you can do thermal ablation. You can do a couple of sessions of foam and then let people settle down. And really people with heavy burdens of venous disease, uh, C3, C4 and, and beyond, usually need more foam within the first 12 months. So it's okay to go back later. So the way the analogy uh, that I use is, hey, we're gonna go in and we're gonna, you know, basically spray down, we're gonna age an orange, you know, an acre lot of overgrowth for the last 40 years, your entire wow. lifetime. And then we're gonna walk back through uh, the lot, you know, in six months or, or eight months or nine months, and we're gonna get rid of whatever's left over. Yeah. So, so um, again, the, the proper way to think of a vein patient is they're, you're your patient forever. Yeah. The now, one I'm and done thing needs to be flushed. You're, you're right. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think people don't realize, uh, especially the patients, you have to have that staging discussion with them because they, so a lot of times they think because of advertising, you know, that's out there, they think that it's, they're going to walk in and it's going to be a one and done thing. Right. And they think that it's not going to come back and they think that, Oh, and you know, the other concern they have is cost because of their high deductible. How much is this going to cost? And you have to have that talk with them about, okay, we're going to do the, the, the ablation. But then after that, it's, it, there's a lot of pruning and touch-ups that need to be done to keep it, you know, to get where we want to be. You know, and I think that, that that discussion with the patient is very important in terms of expectations. Absolutely. Setting the proper expectation for a patient. We hammer that not only yeah. in the recovery of foam square therapy, where people are going to have tender knots, big deal. If you explain it to them, it's right. not a big deal. If you explain to them, they're going to have a little bit of pigment here and there, but that stuff's going to go away if they're properly treated. I can yeah. talk about that later. It's all about setting the proper expectation. Yeah. Um, look, I tell folks, look, you're going to get world-class care here. We're going to take care of every tributary vein. We're going to fumigate your leg with foam. You're going to feel great, but it could be months or years, and you're going to be back as your symptoms start to regress. Now, what I tell them is you're never going to go back to where you started when you first walked through this office, but at some point, your symptoms will regress, and you will need some ongoing treatment, and guess what that's going to be? It's going to be foam. Right. We're going to drop an F bomb on them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the nice thing about the the subsequent treatments and the nice thing about foam, as you've mentioned multiple times, is it is low cost. So you know, while the you know somebody might have a high deductible and they have to pay a, a you know good amount for the the ablation up front, after that their their cost is going to be minimal with the foam treatments, which is nice. That is, that is correct. I tell them once we get through this series of truncal ablations or whatever, you will never need that again for the rest of your life. Right. However, right. you will need a few F-bombs dropped on you <laughs> every now and again. Yeah, no, that's good. So I want to get into a little bit more advanced for people who are out there currently doing foam and maybe afraid of using it for perforators for you know those patients with ulcers, C4 through C6. What's, what's, you know, one thing when I was doing this, I was always, you know, very afraid and wary of keeping that foam out of the deep system. And I do that obviously with watching it closely under ultrasound, but I just wanted to know if you had any tips or tricks for, for that, for perforators and, and just keeping it out of the deep system. Well, well, I do. First of all, do not be afraid. I think it's, it's important for me to review something that just about everybody on this podcast is going to understand. All of us have done lower extremity venography. Now I've done a ton because I'm an old time IR. And we all know that it is very difficult to drive venous contrast when you have an IV in the back dorsum of the foot into the deep system. You have to try really, really hard, ladies and gentlemen. You got to put tourniquets at multiple levels. And then what else? The flow in the deep venous system is much faster than the superficial system, okay? It's all popping in your heads right now. Anytime you do an upper extremity venogram or a lower extremity venogram, there is a difference between the flow in the superficial system and the deep. So the vast majority of blood coming out of the legs, the deep system, and it's fast, okay? It's fast. Why is that important to know? Why is that gonna diminish your fear level? 
Well, first of all, the fundamentals of foam is the sclerosin is metabolized by your blood proteins within eight seconds. You might see the bubbles, which we've already talked about, but the agent's no longer active. So just so you, if you see bubbles in the deep system or, or, or wherever, you know, the brain or the common femoral vein, it, the, the sclerosing action is no longer present. It is gone in eight seconds. Let me go further. So I close off perforators as big as your fingers all the time with foam. As you're, the way to think about foam is you don't inject foam. And this is a nod to Karosh Parsi, an MD, PhD dermatologist from Sydney, Australia, who in my opinion is the leading authority on you know, both the basic science and in many ways, the clinical aspects of foam scleric therapy. The way Karosh talks about foam is you implant foam, okay? So the sine qua non of closing a vein is if you don't get spasm, you have not reached the threshold of enough foam to really damage that vein. So you can inject foam very slowly in a superficial system, watch it go streaming into the deep system, but you're never going to get the critical mass or volume of foam to actually do any damage to the intima of the vein uh, or the deep system. Okay, let me digress a second. The literature shows beyond shadow of all doubt that there is a higher risk of, of DVT, significant DVT after trunchal ablation procedures than foam. Hmm. Seems counterintuitive, but it's true. Now where you gotta watch out for foam is in thrombus here and there, is in the calf system or the soleus muscles in those channels, because we all know there's slow flow there too, right? Mm -hmm. So let me get back to that in a moment. So Aaron, as I'm injecting foam into the superficial system, I'm, you're getting it in perforating veins. I think there's 160 of the darn things. And just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Mm -hmm. But as you're, as you're implanting the foam, you're implanting it, you're getting a critical mass of that foam, you're instantly inducing spasm into that vein. And if you're if you're getting a critical mass of foam across the perforating vein, Aaron, you're getting spasm. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, you're already limiting any damaging effects of foam getting in the deep system. You follow me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, you think, if you think back you know, to, to what we know about the physiology of a venogram, this all it makes sense. You know, do I have an article yeah. about it? No, but I've, I've done a crap load of it and I have the context of an interventional radiologist. So, so anyway, there is, please don't be afraid of closing perforators with foam. I do yeah. it all the time. You, I don't need, I don't need a thermal ablation device to do it. I don't need glue. Right. I can do it with foam all day long, safely, not a big deal. No, but I think that's very helpful. And it would have been very helpful for me when I first started treating perforators with foam because, you know, you tend to be overly cautious and prudent and then you under treat, right? And Absolutely. then they just have to come back. So knowing those things and, and you know, you don't want to be overly aggressive, but knowing, you know, the, the appropriate level of aggressiveness to get those shut down so that it just leads to less treatments in the future. You know. Absolutely. So uh, a few other tips. So if you're above the knee, you can safely inject uh, at, at very high speed, honestly, one to two mils of foam. No yeah. big deal. Below the knee, you know, if you're just starting out, I would recommend not more than a half cc of foam because <clears throat> you can get a little thrombus across, you know, the, the fascia there in the perforating vein that can cause pain from time to time. But there's some very interesting articles. Again, article again by Karosh Parsi that describes the difference between deep venous thrombosis, Aaron, and deep vein sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And I encourage, again, I'm not, you know, I haven't monetized my site. So again, the foam sclerotherapy experts site. And so I want to be real clear about that. No conflict of interest here, but there's a lot of good stuff that I, mm. that, that is curated there that will make people much more comfortable with foam. Do not be afraid of it. it you have to try really hard to yeah. produce a DVT in someone. And this notion of pressing on perforators and pressing on the common femoral vein, you're just going to change hemodynamics, which I think is worse, frankly. And there is, they've looked at this in, with actually trials and studies, and there is no benefit to those fancy maneuvers. I don't lift the leg up. 
I, I can do these on a regular non, non power exam table. I do it all the time. If I do anything, I will maybe more often than not, if I'm injecting foam below the knee, I will have the patient um, activate their calf muscle pump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A, a, yeah. You know, for, a, for five seconds makes me feel better. Maybe it does something. But those are a few little tips that people might benefit from. I, I do want to get into follow-up and, and recurrences here in a, in a minute, but do you ever have them take, you know, ibuprofen for a couple of days just to, because it does spur an inflammatory process, you know, if you successfully sclerose those superficial veins and it can be painful, right? Especially for your, the elderly population. Do you ever have them take any kind of prophylactic? Nope. Prior to COVID, no. Okay. Never. What I recommend after I do foam, wear your compression hose, yeah. doctor's orders, go to the mall, wherever you like to walk around, golf, Pilates, yoga, treadmill, I don't care. I, I, I actually like people to remain at their same activity level or even step it up a bit. No yeah. non-steroidals. In our practice, again, because I think we know what we're doing with foam, 5% or less of patients have exquisite tenderness or pain after mm. foam. And, and, and I think some of that is not only how we manage the patient, but actually how we treat, you know, how we address the veins. Yeah. And, and part of that is when uh, I might as well just get right into it. Uh, one and done foam is also a fool's errand. Okay. You're going to have to do at least two. You want to go back and make sure that that entire vein is closed. If it's spongy, as we determine, you know, it's spongy, the vein isn't non-compressible or it's only partially compressible. You want to put more foam in there. Do not be afraid of that. There's this notion out there that you can inject foam into a, a previously treated foamed vein. Mm -hmm. That's just garbage. We do yeah. it all the time. You know, so you want to go back and make sure that you've gotten enough foam. I'll take it further. How many people that all the people that don't have foam as a safety net how many times does your truncal vein not close? Sometimes we'll see a spongy truncal vein after thermal ablation. I'll hit it with foam. It's what I call I'll reinforce it with foam. I have absolutely no hesitation. I've never had a complication from doing it. I don't think anyone can point to an article that says I shouldn't do it. I do it routinely. I will inject foam in what otherwise appears like a closed thermally ablated vein or a partially closed foamed vein. And in many cases, you need to do it, Aaron, or that vein's not going to fully close. Mm -hmm. And the reason people progress to pain and exquisite tenderness is you're leaving um, a thrashing, partially dead vein under the skin. You've got to kill it with the foam. And so yeah. we fight fire with fire. Let me make one more point while I'm there. If someone, I treat SVT all the time with foam scleric therapy. If you leave the intima intact and alive on an SVT patient, you're going to hurt like hell. Hmm. Um, at least my anecdotal experience, I have uh, no problem injecting foam into a thrombosed SVT. I kill the intima of the vein. That patient's feeling better within days. Ah, that's interesting. Kill the intima of the vein. It's yeah. talking to the patient. And when you do foam sclerotherapy and you follow up, if you leave partially treated veins, yeah, you're going to hurt the crap out of people. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's inter That's very interesting. I never heard that before because I, you know, always think of treating it conservatively with, you know, nope. NSAIDs, compression stockings, cold packs. Fire you know. with fire. <laughs> Spray more foam on it, Aaron. Well, that's, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. And so, you, one more uh, question in terms of follow up: how how long do you have them wear stockings after your foam treatments? That is a great question. And boy, are there all sorts of articles about, yeah. you know, how long you should do it and this and that. So what I tell these patients is, I want you to wear your hose a minimum of two weeks after the last procedure. So okay. our average patient's going to have a thermal ablation and two foams, or perhaps two thermal ablations and two foams. So we're going to see them three or four times before they're, we're going to be finished with the one leg. We do one leg at a time. And then if we're still friends, we go to the other leg, which is what I tell patients all the time. That's supposed to be funny, but it's probably a lot of context here. But anyway, after the last procedure, which is the second foam session, I tell them, wear your hose a minimum of two weeks. After that, 
you can determine whether you're sell whether you want to wear them uh, for yourself. Uh, a lot of patients are going to feel better in hose after foam scleric therapy for weeks, if not a couple of months. So I'm not overly prescriptive about that. I say wear them a minimum of two weeks, and then if you want to take them off and you feel okay, no big deal. We, we must remember that the, the real purpose of hose after at least foam scleric therapy is patient comfort. It theoretically prevents the stretching of nerves around the inflamed veins. And foam is often more uh, uncomfortable than in the post-procedure period than thermal because the veins we're treating, Aaron, are close to the skin where all our nerves are because our nerves mm. live right under, right under the dermis. So um, we don't put people in hose because it necessarily improves the efficacy of what we do. It's mostly for their comfort. So I let them decide after the two week period. Now, let me catch back up to something that, I, that, that we skipped over and it was pre COVID. We all know the world literature's borne this out that the incidence of DVT has really gone up around the world in COVID, post COVID. And in many asymptomatic patients, they must have some kind of uh, mild vasculitis going on. I can tell you personally, I've seen more de novo SVT and DVT in my practice in, since March of 2020. And I've also seen an unprecedented number of post-procedure DVTs in my practice since then. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I've seen more in the, uh, since March of 2020 than I've seen in 15 years. Wow. Uh, that's saying a lot. Yeah. Now, they haven't been, none of the DVTs we've had here have been consequential. They're, they're mostly calf DVT or the few femora pops that we've had have been short segment and virtually asymptomatic. We find them in follow-up. So obviously we anticoagulate those with femora popliteal thrombus. So in any case, that was my caveat. So what am I doing in my practice that I instituted several months ago <clears throat> as I'm having everybody take it, at least a baby aspirin or one non-steroidal a day, you know, some ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, at least one a day during treatment and up to a week after we're done with the treatment protocol. You know, no evidence for that, just just yeah. abundance of caution and being right. prudent. You know, as we shift rapidly from fee for service to fee for value medicine, you know, you've suggested that foam will dominate the treatment of patients. Can you elaborate on that? And it's sort of the future of foam where you see it. Well, yeah, I, I can elaborate on that. Again, I'm going to struggle because <laughs> the recovering detail part of me and, and my policy uh, depth, quite frankly. So look, I've been advocating on the behalf of our profession since I was an intern. Medicine's a profession worth preserving. It's been on full scale attack since you and I, since before you and I became you know, practicing physicians were being relegated to, um, you know, assembly line workers and being owned by the medical industrial complex. Sorry, I'm editorializing. But uh, while I'm not a cheerleader for fee for value medicine, it's the cards we've been dealt and I've been involved in it at the ground zero level for many years now. You know, the I think it was 2010 Obamacare really set those wheels in motion where we're, we're going to be paid not fee for service, where the more we do, the more we make, but where we're going to be paid under fee for value medicine, which is essentially at worst, the less we do, the more we make. It's gain sharing. Mm -hmm. But more specifically, it's taking care of populations. So uh, there's a sea change that a lot of my colleagues and frankly, industry, legacy industry, isn't really quite wrapping their arms around yet, but we're having a sea change from fee for service medicine to fee for value. And if you're in a more heavily penetrated insurance marketplace, you're already feeling that. In fact, the current administration, I think, plans on having virtually every Medicare patient in the country on some fee for value program in the next four years. So this has been underway for a decade, and I've been talking about it for at least a decade. So if you're paid, Aaron, well, let me explain gain sharing or, or fee for value medicine. It's like there's a city block uh, of plumbing and you're going to go to a plumber and you're going to say, all right, I'm going to pay you $100,000 to take care of all the plumbing in these two high rise buildings on this block for the next year. And if there's a couple of block toilets, you know, then you're going to keep 99 
$99,000 of that money, all right? It might only cost you $1,000 to deal with clogged up toilets in the high rises over the next year. But if there's a bunch of pipe failures and you need to go in there and, and replace a bunch of pipes in these things, that also comes out of that money we're going to mm. pay you. Yeah. This is exactly what's going on in this country. There are many physicians, mostly primary care, that are taking on risk in the country. They are taking as solo docs 500 or 1,000 patients and be pay, being paid a per member uh, a per month fee to take care of these patients lock, stock, and barrel. Right. Okay. So look, we doctors do what we're paid to do. We've been paid under a fee for service uh, program for decades. We didn't make this up. We didn't determine how we get paid, but now it's changing. And so now we're incented to take the best care of patients at the least cost. It's really a completely different paradigm and different universe than fee for service medicine. It's totally mm -hmm. different. So ask yourself, it's kind of fun to do. You know, if you're an attorney, how would fee for value work for me? I'm probably getting too long winded, but I'm going to give you another example. So I helped a health law attorney buddy of mine um, with some ghost editing on a book he was writing about fee for value medicine. And I said, I said, Jonathan, I've got a matter I need some help with. I'm going to pay you $5,000. You're going to draft the contract. And then any BS that comes out of that contract, like if I get sued or, you know, we need to go to court on the result of that contract, it's going to come out of your hide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to pay for it. And he said, well, Chris, you know, I'm not sure it really works that way. I said, well, that's what you think is all great and wonderful about fee for value medicine. So in any case, it's, it's kind of fun to look at what other professions would do under this model. But this model is here. It's not right. going away. It was codified in bipartisan legislation, macro MIPS law back in 2015. And I've been quoted because I'm involved in a clinically integrated network that there is a way to take good care of patients and sleep at night and do what's best for the patient under fee for value medicine. However, there, there is a floor, you know, there is a floor at which cost cut are cut so low that, you know, people are going to get hurt. You follow mm -hmm. me? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm trying to give an hour long talk in, in just a few minutes, but there is a pathway when we're incented to take good care of patients and save money. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we covered a lot, but I, I think this is great for people both already involved with superficial venous disease, but also those trainees and, and people looking to get, get into it. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Any, anything, any final thoughts before we sign off? No, sir. Again, I sincerely appreciate the invitation. I hope I was more than just a little bit provocative, <laughs> but I, it's not on purpose. It's just, I believe what I'm saying and I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye.